Hey, I'm Lana Glosha, and I've been working with pan pastels for quite some time. Over the years, I've definitely learned what works and what doesn't with this particular medium. And I am going to share with you the biggest mistakes that we have made with pan pastels so that you don't have to. I am going to discuss mistakes one through nine while I work on this particular piece. And then I am going to actually make mistake number 10 on this piece and talk to you about how I addressed it and fixed it. So make sure you stay until the end. Mistake number one is not fully understanding the surface that you're using. Pan pastels are compatible with a variety of different surfaces, but each of them interacts with the pan pastels in a unique and specific way. This particular piece was done on Lux Archival sanded paper, but pan pastels can also be used very effectively on pastel mat and even some smooth white cotton papers. But they each work a little differently, so it's important that you understand your surface, the characteristics of your surface, and how the pan pastels work on them. I would recommend starting with a bit of research on a paper that you are interested in if you're going to try a new surface. You can do this with YouTube videos and reviews. You can reach out to other artists in Facebook groups and online forums, or you can reach out to specific artists that are using that surface on Instagram. After you've done a bit of research and you've invested in a specific paper, be sure to experiment with this paper a little bit before you transition onto a more time consuming piece. And this leads us on to mistake number two, which is not having a test sheet. Recently, I had a student try pastel mat for the first time. She went out and purchased one sheet of nine by 12 inch pastel mat and she used it for a commission portrait. At a certain point in the project, she wasn't really happy with a piece of the drawing and wanted to figure out how to solve the problem, but she didn't have any extra pastel mat available because her commission portrait was the exact same dimensions as her paper. This was a really stressful situation and it made every mark really high stakes. So I would recommend that when you work with a new surface, that you purchase at least one sheet of that surface or purchase a sheet large enough so that you have some paper to play around with. For a test sheet to be as effective as possible, it needs to be the same color and the same texture as the project paper. Also, if you are going to troubleshoot or experiment, try to simulate the conditions of your project as closely as possible on your test sheet. Mistake number three is working flat. Now, pan pastels are a dry powdery material that is much more delicate than colored pencils. And when artists work on a flat surface, they're much more likely to lean on their work or drag their arm, their hand, or their clothing through the project. And it's a lot easier to avoid this smudging and damage when you're working in a vertical orientation. When you're working up on a vertical easel, you also are able to control the fallout a little bit more. Now, fallout is the powder that doesn't quite stick onto the surface. And this is really common when you're working with pan pastels on a textured surface like sanded paper or pastel mat. When you are working vertically, the fallout naturally just settles in the tray of your easel and you can wipe it up with a damp towel at the end of your session. But when you are working on a flat surface, the fallout stays right there on the top and settles there. And you have a couple bad options to get rid of it. One option is to blow it off, but this introduces your powdered pigment into your breathing air, which isn't a really healthy option and you can get a little bit of spit on your project when you're blowing the dust off. The other option that you might have is to wipe it or brush it away with your hand, but this can drag the particles through your work and damage and smudge it. If I have to work on a flat surface, then the way I deal with fallout is to pick up my project and to tap it onto the table letting as much powder settle naturally onto the table as possible. And then I'll just wipe it up with a damp cloth. The fourth mistake that I see artists making is not using the appropriate painting tool. When you purchase a set of pan pastels, it typically comes with at least one tool to apply the pan pastels. These tools are soft and spongy and are called soft tools, and they are by far the best product to use 
to apply your pan pastels. But I didn't realize how good these tools were until I saw students using a bunch of different alternatives. When students would purchase their pan pastels open stock or one at a time, they would often forget to purchase the soft tools as well, and then they would scramble and try to find something to use in its place. I have seen artists use paintbrushes, blending stumps, cheap makeup applicators, and even their fingers to apply the pan pastels. And what these all have in common is that they don't hold the pan pastel very well, they end up making a huge mess, and they ultimately end up wasting your pan pastels. So I highly recommend using soft tools with the pan pastel, and furthermore, using the appropriate soft tool for the job. So if you're doing a big background, don't try to do that with a teeny tiny palette knife. Instead, grab a larger sponge that's gonna save you time and it's going to have a better effect. I like to have a couple large tools for those backgrounds. I like to work with several palette knives. These are my favorite tools for applying a, a base layer. And then I like to have a couple small applicators for those tiny details. Mistake number five is the mistake I am most likely to make when working with pan pastels, and that is applying too much of this medium. When I work with pan pastels, it takes me back to when I worked with oil paints because I have all of my colors laid out. I can grab it with a brush-like tool and apply it to my canvas really quickly. But if I apply the same amount of pan pastel to my surface as I did oil paint to my canvas, I end up in big trouble. Finding the perfect amount of pan pastel is a bit of a guessing game when you start out and you need to experiment and play around a bit before you commit to an amount of pan pastel. I recommend using enough pan pastel so that you can clearly see the color that you are laying down, but not so much that it begins to fill in the tooth of the paper. When you apply too much pan pastel to any surface, you are going to have a more difficult time getting your colored pencils to adhere to the tooth of the paper. When this happens on pastel mat or a smooth cotton paper, you're going to end up really frustrated and often I've seen artists just ditch the project altogether. If you do this on sanded paper, you can use fixative to fix the pan pastel onto the surface and reintroduce more texture and more tooth to your paper. But this tends to introduce a whole new set of issues which I will talk about in mistake number six. Mistake number six is using fixative incorrectly. Perhaps the biggest issue that I see when it comes to using textured fixative is artists assuming that this fixative is going to behave like other workable fixatives that they've used in the past. But textured fixative is specifically intended to add texture back onto your surface. This results in a chunkier spray that is much more likely to splatter and a can that is much more likely to get clogged. I have found that the best way to unclog a can is to remove the cap, soak it in some hot water for maybe two to three minutes, and then wipe the nozzle off with a paper towel. Then you will reapply that cap, shake it up for 30 to 60 seconds, and then spray it upside down a few times to clear the nozzle. The other thing that I wanna mention is that before I spray it onto the surface of my drawing, I test it on a sheet of paper or a piece of cardboard first. And I want to do this so that I can catch any splattering or messy marks that might come out of this can. When it's coming out clean, then I go over and I apply it to my project. I mentioned textured fixative in my last video and I got this great question from JT. I have a question regarding coats of fixative. You mentioned four to five coats of the textured fixative. Do you let it dry completely between coats? How long between coats? Your videos are very informative and I appreciate them. Thank you. JT, thank you so much for your kind words and your question. I love getting questions from my viewers and I thoughtfully respond to each question or comment that I receive. If you have a question, be sure to leave it down in the comment section below 
And if you don't have a question at this time, but you have benefited from this video, I would love it if you nudge that like button, which will encourage the algorithm to share the video with more artists that will benefit from it. Thank you so much for your participation and support. Now back to JT's question. When I apply textured fixative, I typically let it dry for anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, but I live in a fairly dry climate. And when I have days that are colder or more humid, it does affect the dry time on this textured fixative, making it more of a 20 to 25 minute dry time. After the coat of fixative has dried, I will test it with my finger. I'll just dab my finger on the surface and I look for two things. I check to see if the fixative is dry which will allow me to apply another coat if needed. And I check to see if any pan pastel comes off on my finger. If quite a bit of pan pastel comes off, I know I need to apply another coat. Mistake number seven is dragging your hand through the pan pastel. Now, I mentioned that you could solve some of these problems in an earlier step when I told you to work vertically, but when you switch over to working with colored pencils, you're likely going to be working slower and you're going to need to rest your hand at some point during the process. And if you lay your hand right down into the pan pastels, it's going to make a mess on your hand and it's also going to drag your pan pastels around on your project. So what I recommend doing is adhering a piece of tracing paper or glass scene onto your drawing board so that your hand can rest on this instead of the pan pastels. Mistake number eight is working with the wrong colored pencils. In an earlier video, I discussed that I use luminance colored pencils almost exclusively in these three pieces. Luminance colored pencils are a waxier colored pencil and are great for laying opaque details over the top of pan pastels. I've also enjoyed using Derwent drawing pencils on occasion for the same reason, that they're very waxy and that they can lay opaque marks over the top. Oilier colored pencils like Polychromos or even the Light Fast colored pencils by Derwent are not as good at laying those opaque color down. They're more of a transparent colored pencil. And for me, they don't work as well with my pan pastels on sanded paper, but both polychromos and light fast pencils work really well when I use them over the top of pan pastels on pastel mat. And they also work really well on a smoother white cotton paper. So again, this is one of those things, be sure to experiment and play around with different colored pencils so that you can get the effect that you want. If you would like to learn more about how colored pencils behave on sanded paper, check out this in-depth video, which goes through a number of different colored pencils and talks about their qualities and characteristics on the unique surface that is sanded paper. Mistake number nine is using dull colored pencils over pan pastel. When you have a pan pastel base layer, it typically requires more pressure from you to get your colored pencils to stick on the surface than it would not having that pan pastel layer there already. Think handwriting pressure or even a little bit harder. Now, this heavier pressure combined with possibly a textured surface is going to dull your pencils at a much faster rate. And often with the pencils getting dull faster, artists tend not to sharpen them as often because it feels like you're always sharpening a pencil. For some parts of your drawing, you might not need as sharp of a pencil, but more often than not, you will benefit from a nice sharp point. I like this Derwent pencil sharpener. It creates a really long, sharp point that allows me to use the tip for fine details and to use the side for blending, burnishing, and glazing. Mistake number 10 is poor planning. When I selected the photo reference to use for this piece, I selected it because I loved the colors and I love that it fit the theme of unripe fruit that I was using for the other two pieces in this mini series. But I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about how I was going to handle the background. I was moving really quickly and I just went for it. 
After working on this piece for several hours, I realized that the background was really busy and confusing and that it wasn't working with the foreground very well. And if I had taken some more time in the beginning to plan out my composition, how I was going to apply the pan pastels and how I was going to respond with colored pencils, I probably wouldn't have been in this situation. But since I found myself here, I jumped into problem solving mode and I decided to start blending out my colored pencils with solvent. Solvent is incredibly effective when you use it on sanded paper because the sanded paper has already broken up the binder and the pigment quite a bit when you applied it onto the surface and it is looser on the surface than it is on a smooth white cotton paper. When you apply the solvent, it moves around a lot, almost like paint. And if you use your mark really aggressively, you can almost completely blend out and erase areas, which is exactly what I did with the background in this area. I blended it out so it started to disappear. I let the solvent dry and then I came back over the top with colored pencils so that the original background had been completely obliterated. The process for creating this background was pretty messy, but not every background goes that way for me. I recently completed a piece with a out of focus background that I really loved, and I'm gonna show you exactly how I did that in an upcoming video. So if you don't wanna miss that video, be sure to turn on your notifications or sign up for my newsletter so that you can get an update on new videos straight to your inbox. I'm still not crazy about this area of empty space. I feel like it's not very interesting. So recently I've been playing around with cropping the image over on Photoshop, and this is my favorite cropped option. But I can't decide on which one I like best, so I wanna hear from you. Jump down into the comments and let me know if you think that I should keep this piece the way that it is, or if I should crop it. I would also love to hear which of these 10 mistakes you've been making, and if there are any mistakes that I've missed. So leave those thoughts down in the comments below. Well, that's all for now. Thank you so much for watching. Now go have a beautiful and creative day. Bye.